Good afternoon. So with each of these taxon-based sampling that we do, it's unique. There's challenges for each group. And so I'm going to be focusing just on the bird aspect. So some of these will not be germane if you're doing plant sampling or doing herbs or mammals. So this is specialized on avo faunal, but many of the things that I'll talk about can be used by sampling other taxonomic groups. So these questions that you want to be able to answer when you're doing one of these, planning one of these inventories is why, where, and when. So some of the reasons of why we do this, many areas have never been surveyed. And even some of those uh, areas that have been surveyed in the past may have been done without new technologies. For example, one of the most common things for, that we use for detecting a large percentage of an AVA funnel when we go in an area, that's a relatively new thing. It wasn't until the mid-1970s that we had portable audio recorders. And with recording, depending on the complexity of the environment, for example, in rainforest, if you do not have audio recording equipment, you will probably uh, miss 25% of the fauna. You won't even detect that it's even there, let alone documenting it's there. So for many of these canopy dwelling things, or these secretive species, or things that are nocturnal, unless you have that audio recording equipment, a relatively new technology where it's portable to go out in the field, you're going to miss a lot of the fauna. And in with climate change, we're seeing degradation of a lot of these habitats that have been surveyed. Oh, so I didn't move over. Okay, sorry. And so with that, we need to go back and resample these, not only with these new technologies, new tools for sampling a fauna, but you also need to go back to document the changes over time. And, as, and many of these environments are changing extremely rapidly. Obviously, man is really uh, influencing many of these environments. This is the most obvious one, uh, removing timber. And you can do these kind of uh, surveys, these inventories, these sampling in all kinds of environments. If you're in a desert, obviously it's much easier to sample and it, you're going to uh, get a, a, clearly an inventory of the fauna that is there because of the structure of the vegetation. Whereas if you're in a rainforest site, usually that takes years to document actually what is there. There's many tools now that are available that we didn't have even a few years ago, Google Earth, for ascertaining microhabitats, whether there's an edge situation versus uh, primary forest. Also, that gives you a way to access information on how you're going to establish where you're going to go in to sample an area. Here's a, so a few shots of just giving some uh, different views of uh, environments that we've surveyed. This is in a uh, northern uh, part of Argentina and South America. This is an intermontane desert. This is High Puna. This is above tree line in uh, South America. And again, the techniques we would use for this type of environment are actually fairly different from when you're in a rainforest environment. One, you don't need near as much time to survey this type of environment versus that of rainforest. This is a shot of a temperate zone uh, from southern Argentina, a very wet forest. And that has a whole suite of issues of detectability. Uh, if you're doing a line transect where you're walking down a path, your distance of detectability of the fauna is much more reduced than if you're in an open environment such as a desert where you can literally hear some uh, birds vocalizing over a kilometer away. So the next question you want to ask is well, when is the best time to conduct these surveys? Well, we found in, in most environments the best time to, for detection of the Ava fauna is, is, particularly if it's a seasonal environment where you have a distinct rainy versus dry season, that for detecting the birds, the actual species, the best thing to do is at the beginning of the rainy season. That's when birds anticipate that the rains are coming and they start vocalizing. And that's the, the best detectability tool that we have is when birds are actually vocalizing. Unlike other groups, obviously plants and so forth, that's unimportant. 
This is the kind of environment it's in much of the United States right now. Obviously, if you did a survey during the, summer, uh, the winter months, you might detect a total of 12 to 15 species in this type of environment at this time of year. If you went back to this exact same site during the summer months, in the, in the United States that's June, July, and August, you might have a species list of 70 to 80 species. So you need to think about those kinds of things when you're uh, setting up your survey design. This is a, a picture of a deciduous forest. Uh, this is from Argentina. As I mentioned, when the, you have this uh, dichotomy in rainfall, if you went there during the height of the dry season, most of the fauna is not vocalizing, so you would miss a large percentage of that fauna de detecting that was there. Whereas if you went there at the beginning of the rainy season, you might capture maybe as not much as 90% of the fauna. Give you an example of where we worked in Ghana. We were working the, near the northern border, and the year we went, we didn't appreciate that there had been an unusual amount of rainfall, particularly had been delayed uh, that year into deep into September. We went there in October, and we went to the north in this primarily this grassland. You can see how tall I am gives you an idea of how tall the grass was. That really cut down on our detectability of birds. We couldn't even walk down past. Early in the morning when it was wet, all this grass was hanging over the trails that we were going to use to sample things. You were covered with seeds within seconds. So it's the kinds of things you need to think about even in an arid environment, what the best time of year is to survey these things. So to be able to capture the entire fauna, and certainly that's the case here, you have a lot of migrants coming at different times of the year. Now primarily in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, most of your migrants are coming from northern latitudes and spending the months of September through March, April here. So it, to capture the full fauna, at least from, you know, for birds are unique, you have these migrants. And it can be a significant amount of the avifauna that you'll need to actually survey at different times of the year. If you want to capture that resident fauna, you may do that during the beginning of the rainy season, but if you want to capture that whole migrant fauna, perhaps some of them are just passing through on their way perhaps to South Africa, whereas others are going to spend the whole winter in a site like here in Cameroon, you may have to design your inventories at different times of year. So you may have to do it three or four different times throughout the calendar year. One of the more complicated environments is in South America, because not only do you have migrants coming from North America in September through March, many of them spending the winter in the Amazon basin, but during the months of March through October, you have all these species that are breeding down here in the southern cone of South America that migrate up to these same areas at that time of year. So to do the Amazonian part of South America, you need a minimum of three times of the year to capture the full complement of that fauna. And give you an example, there are some sites here at the base of the Andes in southeastern Peru. It's rainforest, where they originally estimated there were about 300 species there. Well, with the advent of audio recorders and plus doing the seasonal part of things, we have North American migrants and these so-called austral migrants from the south. The list is over 500 species for a single locality, which is pretty impressive, one of the most diverse places on the planet. So logistics, giving you an idea of you know, when you want to do this, but what about setting up you know, the logistics of getting there? The first thing, of course, is your team. When you pick your team, you want to, be, from a bird standpoint, you want to have all the tools. You want to have someone who can do audio recording, someone who can run mist nets. And I'll be talking about that in a few minutes about the tools that we're using. So you, you'll have the full complement of tools available when the team goes in. And we have this rule that you have the no asshole rule, where you have your team members you, where you can get along and you have, where you have one member that might cause the whole rest of the team to have problems. So choose your members carefully when you construct your team, not only from the tools they'll bring, but how well they get along with each other. Important thing to do. Obviously permits, 
wherever you work, whether it's inside your country or whether you're, you're coming from outside, you need uh, permit levels, permits at a number of levels. And then the next thing you need to think about, well, how will we access, access the area? As I mentioned, Google Earth is a great tool these days to take a look at the area and assess how you're going to get in. Many areas you can just drive into. That's the easiest thing. But on, on many of these remote areas that we survey, we have to use aircraft. And this is an Islander. It's the same thing as a twin engine Otter. Their payload is about 1,500 pounds. So you have to think about how much your team weighs and the gear and how long you're going to be in there. So on a complicated trip like we did last spring, in northeastern South America, we had this weight limitation. So we had to weigh every item and know precisely if we were going to have enough food to get us through this. Because we flew into an area where there was no place you could eat, walk for, for kilometers and get food. We literally had porters coming from outside that had to walk three days to meet us at an airstrip, and I'll show you a picture of this. This is what we flew for nearly two hours over solid forest. It's one of the biggest blocks of forest left on the planet. It didn't come out very good. It's kind of dark. You can see that we're starting to get some relief. We are going to an isolated mountain range that no one had ever surveyed from a bird standpoint. And right up here is the airstrip, carved out in the forest. This was actually carved out by gold miners quite a few years ago. We'd had Amerindians come from a village that walked three days. They got there a few days before us. They cleared the vegetation along the strip and burned that area so we could get one of these small aircraft in. And here we are landing on the plane. You can see that the tips of this plane, get this right, almost clipped the vegetation. We hadn't had people in there beforehand. We would not have made it in there. It would have been a disaster. So we spent a total of four weeks inside here. Food was absolutely critical because when we, as we moved up the mountain, there was nothing to eat. You couldn't live off the land. There were very few animals, so we had to calculate the number of pounds of rice or kilos of rice to bring in a, a trip like this. Uh, the, some of the local guys helping us carry our gear, they had these uh, carriers called orishis. You can see this is a uh, a pelican case, you're going to see that when we're in the field. I'll have this as we're carrying our auto recording equipment. Obviously sleeping gear, the bulk of our material was food. We had to cross several rivers to get into this area. So again, we had to think about making sure that our key equipment stayed dry. And other expeditions will often use what we call mule or horse uh, trains where we'll load up our gear on the backs of animals. And you can get an idea of some of the steep terrain that we had to traverse to get into this. So again, the point of all this is you have to think about what's it going to take to get into one of these areas. Oftentimes uh, when we're preserving genetic material, we'll use liquid nitrogen. On this trip we're going to do, uh, about to do in Corp, we're going to be using ethanol to preserve the tissue samples. Now, there are several drawbacks with that when you preserve an ethanol because you have to have it entirely immersed so it's preserved. You can only take a limited amount of genetic material per specimen. If you using liquid nitrogen, and that's, this is a liquid nitrogen tank, you can actually fill up the entire tube and have much more for all kinds of sampling down the road. For example, two new technologies come along, new analyses of genetic material where you may need a much larger sample to ascertain perhaps relationships in a group of organisms you're working with and that little sample that you preserve in the ethanol may not be enough. So ideally we'd like to use liquid nitrogen. This is a 35 liter tank and this is how we, we get it into by carrying in two guys carrying that tank. Once we get into area we set up our work tent, and you guys are going to be seeing that firsthand. We're the same kind of tent. This is kind of the standard work tent that, regardless of what institution you're from, that's kind of the workhorse for, at least for ornithology. Typically, put a tarp over that because most of these areas we go into is heavy rainfall, and we dig trenches 
the long hair because you can imagine even 30 minutes of real strong rain, your camp will be a quagmire. So we have all these drainage dishes that we do right off the bat around these uh, large tents. This is just a sleeping tent, the small green one. Give you an idea of another camp. This is actually was our uh, a kitchen. We had the whole ki kitchen operation there, sleeping tents, and, uh, and I actually took the photograph from the work tent area. Another high uh, Andean camp to give you an idea of how critical some of these tarps are for keeping the operation up and running so you don't get flooded out. 